Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ryan Erickson from uh, Laird Connectivity. I am in our products group at Laird Connectivity and what we do there is simplify wireless connectivity. Uh, I know there's a lot of connectivity there, so. Um, I'm gonna, I got a lot to cover today. I'm gonna breeze through some of the simpler slides. Uh, we're gonna get deep down into this, so I'm gonna get going. Hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So today we're going to talk about how we use Zephyr to solve um, the, the problem of device management of an IoT solution. So how do we manage gateways and end devices from the cloud, um, configuring those devices from the cloud so you have uh, a z zero touch, zero physical touch of the devices, and then uh, remote monitoring and debug to you know, ensure your fleet is uh, operating the way it should. So our Canvas Device Manager um, is our uh, solution that we developed. Uh, it consists of firmware and cloud uh, software. Uh, as part of this solution, uh, devices need to be factory provisioned. Uh, you need to be able to software update them, configure them, monitor their health, uh, be able to diagnose them on the fly and scale your fleet. Um, and also, uh, none of this is useful unless you have telemetry enablement. So you, you want to see some data uh, for your application. So um, what, what, what are the pieces of the system here? So we start with, we have a gateway and we have uh, end devices. So uh, uh, along with the cloud side, we partnered with our partner Edge IQ to give us our platform uh, in the cloud to manage your fleet. So the firm we're running on the gateway um, needs a device management connection um, to get your configuration, your health monitoring, all your diagnostics. Uh, alongside of that, call it your application firmware. It is one firmware image, but in, in this sense, the application firmware is enabling that telemetry, separate telemetry connection to get your data up to uh, the service of your choice. And again, just stressing the, the fa uh, devices ship factory provisioned, uh, so you can, out of the box, connect to the cloud. Real quick, the hardware pieces of this, of this system are our Centrius MG100 gateway. It's an LTE M and BIOT gateway with Bluetooth. So bridging BLE data to the cloud. Our end devices in the system are our Centrius BT610 IO sensors. Uh, it's an IP67 BLE sensor, uh, has four different sensor ports, you know, quite configurable for different kinds of sensors, analog inputs, digital inputs, outputs. Um, or serial bus type applications. So when developing this uh, device management platform, obviously there's here some of the high, in, uh, high level requirements here are security, uh, number one. Uh, using open standards and protocols, this is important because it gives us flexibility in transitioning to other systems if needed in the future. Uh, no touch deployment and management of the fleet uh, and health monitoring. So in order to get into how we did the gateway all the way down to the end device, um, I need to talk about the protocols that we used. So as sticking with part of our requirements to have standard protocols, we chose to use the lightweight MDM protocol. Uh, the lightweight MDM protocol is a application layer protocol built on top of CoAP and then built on top of UDP. Um, it has a schema-based object model that represents objects and underneath those objects, resources associated with your device. So in, in the overall solution, you have your gateway uh, connecting uh, or managing all the end devices. So lightweight M2M -M is um, representing objects or you know, uh, objects being important things you care about on your device. Underneath those objects, you have resources. The objects and resources have defined IDs per the specification. Um, 
and it has flexibility to create your own if you, you find something that you don't, uh, that, that the spec has or doesn't have and you, you want to do. Um, standard objects include um, stuff for connectivity monitoring, firmware updates, and whatnot. The, the base uh, schema of Lightweight MDM has four levels. You have your object ID at the top. Per object ID, you have a number of instances of that object in certain cases. Then uh, per instance of object, a, uh, one or more resources. And then underneath that, one or more instances of those resources. So you can think of it like a uh, directory structure um, going from most generic and getting more specific. So going along uh, to show an example of this, uh, in, the, uh, in this case, uh, we're, we'll look at object three. Object three is the device object per the specification. It is a, re a required object when you implement a lightweight MDEM device. So object three has a number of resources underneath it. In this case, we're, we're showing how you would uh, represent uh, resource two. So at the top level, slash three, slash zero for the first instance of object three, and per the spec, uh, it is specified that only one instance of object three is allowed uh, on your device. So it will only ever be three slash zero, and then whatever resource you want to access underneath that. So in this case, uh, we're, we want to look at resource two. Resource two happens to be um, the serial number. So uh, in this case, from the cloud, you would query, hey, give me three slash zero slash two, it will send you back the serial number of the device. Uh, at the bottom here is the link to the OMA uh, registry. This is where you can go to look at all the official objects uh, in the specification. So uh, now that we know how Lightweight MDEM is uh, structured, we can talk about Lightweight MDEM Gateway. That's part of the spec. Lightweight MDEM Gateway takes uh, the same structure but adds a prefix on the front. Um, so the Lightweight MDEM Gateway can use these prefixes to uh, identify nodes that the gateway is talking to. So everything works the same. Uh, the node just gets prefixed on the front, and the gateway will see that and know what end device to talk to. So. Object 25 is the, the object for Lightweight MDEM Gateway. So each, there'll be multiple instances of Object 25 representing each end device that the gateway sees. Um, the, the, the server can then query these Object 25 instances to discover the end nodes and uh, know what their capabilities are. So uh, resource zero under object 25 is the unique ID of the device. Uh, resource ID one defines the prefix for that device, and that prefix is what gets uh, added onto the front in order for, for the cloud uh, to be able to interact with that device through, through the gateway. And then uh, the third resource is uh, the um, device objects, which tells um, the server what the capabilities of the end device are. So those device capabilities are uh, specified uh, in a certain format, and this format's called uh, the core link format. So this is defined by the spec. There's a specific, uh, it's, a, it's a string, and there's a specific format to it that lets the uh, gateway then query the end device and construct that string, throw it in that resource, and now the server knows what that end device is capable of. So um, let's see here. Um, so when a end device registered with the gateway, at that point, that's when the gateway uh, queries all of the um, capabilities of the end device and, and fills that in uh, as kind of the part of the registration process. So here's a, okay, that's big enough. Uh, here's a quick 
diagram kind of showing where we're at here now. Uh, so we have our, um, our gateway up at the top. Uh, it itself is running its own lightweight MDEM client, so the, uh, it, it has its own objects and resources, so the gateway itself can be managed. Um, then, uh, to diagram kind of the stack here of how we're going to talk to our, our end device, we, you know, we have lightweight MDEM, co-app, and then we're going to have some sort of RF protocol uh, to talk to our wireless sensor. In this case, it's going to be BLE, and we're going to go into how that's done. Uh, on the, on the end device, it is running uh, its lightweight MDEM client as well, and it has its own objects and resources to represent what it's capable of. So in order to make all this useful, the first piece you need is a server. Um, the server needs to provide uh, smart support for Object 25. Um, this allows applications to interact with the end devices just as they, uh, just as a user would, would uh, interact with the gateway itself. So uh, the gateway instantiates dynamically uh, instances of object 25 based on end nodes it sees. And then the platform is going to provide you know similar functionality uh, for each device that you want to manage so it's kind of a seamless experience. You, you know in, in the end you don't care that uh, you're managing a gateway or an end device although you, you do want to know that but in the end you want to be able to firmware update each of these devices and, and do it reliably, right? So I'm going to take, through, take you through some of the uh, scenarios of how the devices are talking to the cloud. So first off, it all starts with the gateway registering. Uh, this is you know registering with the server so the server knows it's out there. So the gateways obviously uh, usually are an IP-enabled device. Uh, in this case, we're talking over cellular connection. So it can talk directly with the server. Um, again, uh, the lightweight MDEM messaging uh, is at the highest level underneath the COAP protocol, protocol is used. Uh, for security, we're using uh, DTLS with, with UDP down at the lowest level. So. The gateway comes online, it gets on the network, it sends up its registration, that's the term used in lightweight MDM, to uh, connect to the server and let the server know it's there. Uh, the lightweight MDM server will then, uh, of course, act that, and now the device is registered and connected. Keep in mind that, uh, right, we're, we're a UDP connection, so much of the protocol is, you know, handshake, uh, send receive type responses. So then uh, if you want to do something with the gateway, of course you're going to initiate a request from the server. Um, the gateway will respond to that uh, request and give you its information. Now we move on to the end nodes. So the gateway has to have some smarts uh, and we're going to get into that, but at a high level, you have your end device, and each time a new end device is seen by the gateway, we got to register it. Uh, this this is a little bit different. So, the the end node has its own lightweight MDEM client, as I mentioned, and its own capabilities. So when it comes online, it's going to um, use this, the same protocol here, right? We're, we're trying to keep, uh, use standards. So the end device is still gonna use lightweight MDEM and we're gonna get into how then we send that lightweight MDEM packets over a non-IP interface. First, the end node, end node is gonna broadcast, hey, I'm here, I, it has a flag in its advertisement saying, you know, I need you to do something. I have data for you. Then the gateway will say, okay, yeah, this is a new device. I don't have you in my list. Uh, I'm going to request your core link string so I can get your capabilities. The end device will respond, and that then completes the 
registration of the end device because now the gateway has all the information it needs. It has the device's unique ID. It can then generate a unique prefix for this device and it has its core link string so we can fill in all the properties of the object 25 instance that we just created. And then once that object 25 instance is created, a notification gets sent up to the server so now the server knows, oh, you have a, a new end device. There's a new instance of object 25 here and now I know about it. Once your end device is registered, interacting with it is, for all intents and purposes, transparent to uh, the user. It, it works the same way as you would talk to the um, gateway. You're going to send the request down, like, I want to read your serial number. The gateway is then going to say, oh, well, I'm not connected right now, right? This is a wireless device. It's sleeping uh, to save battery. So it's going to say, hey, um, I need to connect. It initiates a connection response, and we, we get connected. And then the data gets sent down to that end device. The end device responds. The gateway receives that response and then relays it back up to the server. After a certain amount of time of inactivity, uh, the gateway will disconnect and let the end device go back to sleep. Obviously, that's really important for battery life. And the last case, if there's a notification that needs to be generated from your end device, your end device is going to use its broadcasting mechanism saying, hey, I'm here. I have set, set a flag that I have data for you. This then triggers the gateway. OK, I got to spin up this connection so we can do some uh, data transfer. And then uh, once the connection is established, that end device can send its notification. And again, the gateway will relay it, relay it up to the server. And again, after a certain time of inactivity, we disconnect and uh, let everything go idle. So how are we going to do this? Um, this is where the spec does not define how to do this. It gives you object 25 and specifies how to use object 25. So in order to do this, we developed what we call a, our lightweight MDM gateway proxy. So it's going to be responsible for that secondary RF connection and, um, and managing all of that. So again, request coming down. It's a lightweight MDM message, which is effectively co-op. Um, so we need to be able to take that co-op message as is. We need to be able to send that over, uh, in this case, Bluetooth. So we're, we chose to use MCU Manager SMP, um, which is a protocol in Zephyr, call it uh, standard, uh, standard for Zephyr, but we chose this because we didn't want to invent some other way to do this, right? There's already something there and we could reuse it. So um, what happens, right? We just take, uh, we, we add that SMP header on top of the lightweight MDM message. So that way we can send it over BLE. Of course, the end device knows, okay, this is a SMP message. I can uh, just take that header off. I have now the raw lightweight MDM message. That message gets sent down to the lightweight MDM client that's already in Zephyr and it gets handled. Then with our response, uh, a co-app message is generated uh, from the lightweight MDM stack. We got to throw our SMP header back on there, send it over Bluetooth, and then uh, the gateway, again, will strip that off, send it back up to the server. So how do we, how do, we do this with SMP? So SMP stands for Simple Management Protocol, right? You can get confused. SMP is used for other uh, abbreviations. So in this case, we're talking about MCU Manager, Simple Management Protocol. It's defined by an eight byte header. Um, so the important parts of this are you got an operation code for read or write, then a group. Oh, I'm sorry, I clicked on that. We got a group which specifies your top level command, 
and then a command ID underneath that group in case you have multiple different messages you want to implement for that group. So in this case, we, all we had to do is define a new uh, group ID, uh, and we called it our uh, lightweight MDEM BLE transport. So we just came up with a number that was outside of the standard number. They have a reserved number area, so we just picked some large number. Uh, we defined a new command ID then underneath that. We only needed one, and we just called it uh, our command tunnel. And so you just use this uh, header as is, and our lightweight MDEM coat buffer just gets inserted into the data, data spot. So just to summarize, we use, this, we use the SMP service uh, with GAT over BLE. It's used just to wrap up lightweight MDEM coat messages uh, between the gateway and the end device. The gateway has to inspect these uh, co-op requests that come down from the server to know, oh, there's a prefix on here, so that means you want to talk to this device. It has to then uh, strip that prefix off, package up the uh, message to send over SMP, and send it to the end device. Um, so then when the gateway and the end device are connected, the gateway writes uh, you know, the SMP characteristic over BLE to send the message, and then uh, notifications uh, over BLE are used to send the, the co-op responses back the other way. Um, and then as part of how the gateway knows to uh, communicate with the end device, we use Bluetooth Low Energy advertisements and, and set a flag in there to indicate, you know, hey, I got something you, you need to do gateway, talk to me. So in order to accomplish this, uh, the first thing we had to do is make some lightweight MDEM stack modifications. The first thing was to separate out dependency on UDP sockets. The lightweight MDEM engine is heavily dependent on UDP. So we needed to remove that dependency, uh, and that was important, obviously, for the end device and the gateway. And then the other major piece is adding in hooks uh, to the stack for received messages. And this is important for the gateway so we can hook in and know, hey, we have a prefix. We got to strip that off and then and do something to connect and send to the gate uh, to end device. So here's a quick snippet of the changes, uh, and I provided a link here. You can go look look at later of the, the all the changes we made. But uh, basically, we pulled the socket socket implementation out of the lightweight MDEM en engine. We added a transport ID to the main lightweight MDEM context in the stack. And then we created uh, a new lightweight MDEM transport and a lightweight M UDP transport files to abstract that all away. So now we have a version of the stack that works exactly the same, but we abstracted out the transport. So this is paving the way for us to add in a new BLE transport for lightweight MDEM. Oh, double switch. All right, next we needed the application hooks. Uh, in order for the gateway to inspect messages coming down from the server. This is a relatively small change, as you can see, only a few files. Um, you can go look at this, but basically, this is what paves our way for implementing the actual Object 25 uh, work. So, then first we needed uh, to implement Object 25 itself, and that's, uh, uh, there's, nice APIs in the lightweight MDEM stack for defining objects. You, you define the object and the resources in there and the, you know, the variable types of the resources, whether it's a byte or a string, all that, right? So, and then after implementing the object, we needed some common APIs that could be reused from, from another layer. So we needed to be able to create and delete instances at runtime. Uh, we needed allow and block list support in case you came across Sensors, let's say you have a gateway in this room and a gateway in that room, but I don't want to talk to the sensors in that room, right? So allow this block list is a very handy thing to have. Uh, and, you know, some uh, other APIs to look up a device by ID to see if it's in the list, if, if, if I've already talked to it before. 
Um, and then after I implementing Object 25 in those APIs, that allowed us to then implement our proxy. And the proxy is what's doing all the, all the work here, right? Uh, if it discovers an end device, it creates an Object 25 instance, it connects to the device, transfers data over BLE as we discussed, packaging it up over SMP. Um, it manages the inactivity timeouts. That's important for sensors being able to roam between uh, gateways. Um, it takes care of processing that, those lightweight end requests from the server and inspecting if there's a prefix and then obviously knowing, okay, strip that off, send the message to the end device. And then um, if a device hasn't been seen for a certain amount of time, we want to remove that object 25 instance from the gateway altogether. This, again, is part of being able to support roaming of uh, devices across gateways. A little bit small, but uh, this details what lightweight M2 M2 objects are using the gateway. So the top, the top two are required. You got lightweight MDM server, which is uh, details about you know, what server you're gonna connect to in the cloud. Uh, device is required. Uh, at, at a minimum, it, it requires you to make a, a, a reboot function. You get access to firmware version, uh, battery levels, uh, and whatnot. And, and device, the device object. Connectivity monitoring, object four is used for information about the LTE connection. So you can get signal strength, IP address, all that good stuff. Uh, object five firmware update, pretty obvious. That's what is used to update the gateway itself. Uh, it's image, it's Zephyr image. Um, object nine, because we have a separate cellular modem in the gateway is uh, object 9 is used to provide firmware update capabilities to that modem. Um, then obviously uh, object 25 is the star of the show. That's what uh, we needed to uh, add in in order to make a gateway be able to talk to end devices. It keeps switching on me. And then in order to facilitate configuration, we we actually had to create two custom objects. Uh, we couldn't find anything in the spec that did what we wanted, so we came up with um, a file system object, which allows you to uh, read directories and see what files are in a directory in a file system, and then a file object to be able to interact with files. So um, that, that plays really well with having a very generic way to configure a device. Everything's done with configuration files and a file system on the device. So very flexible. On the end device, um, a lot of the same, same objects. You got object one, uh, the server object, object three, because again, those are required by the, by a, the client. And then object four for monitoring BLE uh, connection stat statistics. And the firmware, firmware update object again for being able to firmware update the end devices. And then we include uh, three telemetry based, I don't know why that keeps switching, three telemetry based, uh, or actually four telemetry based objects for being able to talk to the different sensors on the end device. You got temperature, current, pressure, and fill level. Um, fill level is used with our ultrasonic sensor uh, for kind of tank monitoring. And then again, the file system and file objects. So here's a quick snapshot of the device management portal. Um, this is our, our partner Edge IQ. So this is your, your portal to be able to manage your fleet. Uh, kind of standard stuff showing how many devices online, offline, that kind of stuff. And then you, know, you can go in per device and interact with each device. I talked at the beginning about being able to remote monitor and, and, and the health of your device. Uh, we have another partner, Memfault, which I'm sure everyone has probably come across them at the conference here. They're fantastic. Great partner to have. Uh, they provide remote debugging capabilities. So your firmware crashes, a core dump is saved the next time it connects, 
sends up that core dump, they analyze it, you could figure out what what crashed in the in the in the firmware. So that's obviously very important, along with knowing what firmware versions are deployed out there and all that kind of stuff. Here's a quick screenshot of the uh, core dump analysis. All right, and obviously it's, it's fun to device manage your device, but if you can't send telemetry, that's a problem. So uh, inherently built into the firmware, we have support for a separate telemetry connection. Uh, we have a few options here. We actually uh, did another modification of Lightweight MDEM stack to support a second Lightweight MDEM connection simultaneously, which you may think is a little strange, but we did it just because, okay, we have our device management Lightweight MDEM connection, but maybe a customer wants to use some other provider uh, for Lightweight MDEM and just do telemetry over that and just do the device management operations over the other connection. So we had that, and then uh, go uh, back. Ryan, I just wanted to let you know you've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Thanks. All right, and then um, our, our other option for telemetry is MQTT. Obviously this uh, enables a wide support of uh, cloud partners, so the customer can choose whoever they want to use and you know, send their telemetry, for their telemetry data there. Um, other features in, in the firmware, uh, device configuration, I touched on it slightly, let me go talk about it a little more here. So uh, for, for development, everything can be configured uh, over the shell, with shell commands. Uh, we call this our attribute system. We developed this uh, kind of cool system where you define attributes with YAML, and then when you build the firmware, it automatically code generates everything you need. Uh, so all you really have to do is just Add an entry in YAML for a new attribute. Is it readable, writable, savable? What type it is? Is it a string? Is it a UN8? Uh, and then it code generates it. So you can uh, you know, get and set all these attributes right from the shell. Uh, then uh, SMP, uh, we talked about using SMP over Bluetooth, but SMP actually has a protocol over shell. So we use SMP over shell for in manufacturing to autom automate uh, setting up device configurations on the manufacturing line. And then all settings are stored in the file system, so this makes it super generic and uh, easy to configure devices from the cloud using our file and file system objects over Lightweight m m We then also provide a configuration template repository for common configurations for, for the end devices. In this case, right, the, the end device sensors are the most complicated thing to configure based on, oh, well, I want this sensor or whatever. So we have a bunch of combinations that, that you can build off of. Uh, touch on some of the security features of the firmware. Um, thanks to NRF Connect SDK, uh, we, uh, they have a really nice hardware unique key uh, API. That is really nice because when the device boots the first time, it generates its own hardware unique key. Um, only the device knows this key. No one else ever can get access to it. It can't be read out of the device. And that key can then be used for encryption. So um, we have a dual boot, uh, dual bootloader secure boot, um, which is nice because using the dual bootloader approach allows us to be able to swap out uh, signing keys of the firmware if something gets compromised. Um, the firmware is signed, uh, obviously, with that. Uh, for the shell system, we built a login uh, system. So, like, if you get physical access and you try and do stuff on the shell, you have to log in first. Obviously, that's that's really nice. Uh, a really nice thing we we worked on is we we came up with a way to encrypt all secrets at rest. Unfortunately, at this time, Zephyr doesn't have an uh, encrypted file system. But what we did is we're using LittleFS. And we designated a folder, and everything in that folder is encrypted. So anytime there's a request coming through the system for something in that folder, uh, the firmware intercepts that and knows, well, that's been encrypted with that hardware unique key. And so the gateway itself, or the end device this is on both, can uh, you know encrypt and decrypt that on the fly. And only it can. So then if... Um, 
that key's ever compromised or someone tampers with the device and erases flash, that key's gone and now all those settings are still protected um, and, and you have to start from scratch and reconfigure the device. And lastly, all our BLE communication is encrypted. We actually encrypted a section of the advertisement um, and then when we get in a connection, that whole data sent over is encrypted at the application layer. Um, the reason we did this is we built in a uh, PKI system so you can have um, public, key, public key infrastructure for those who don't know the acronym. Um, device certificates, private keys for each device and then they, you know, when they, when they start a connection they do a, effectively a TLS exchange of their credentials uh, in order to facilitate this. So using, again, all standards here, right? That's, that's important. And finally, uh, all this firmware is open source because, uh, right, it's Zephyr. We want to make it open source. And one of the main reasons for that is we don't know what a customer wants to do, right? You start here, build on to it, and do exactly what you, you want to do in your end application. And that's it. Uh, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, there is uh, one question uh, that came in virtually. Uh, do you use six low pan between the IoT endnode and IoT gateway? No, we do not. Uh, we are using just, uh, just BLE and that SMP characteristic. Um, the, the reason for this is we wanted to keep it um, a little bit simpler and not deal with uh, IPv6 routing uh, in the gateway. There, I believe there's actually some pieces in Zephyr missing yet to do full proper routing of gateway and end device. Frefro? How do you update the firmware in the IoT nodes? So uh, the question was how do you update firmware in the IoT nodes? Uh, the same way uh, you would the gateway, that object five is represented on the server. And what you do is, how object five works is you write a, a URL. In this case, uh, firmware update supports being able to push or pull, and pull meet from, from the respect of the device. So we, we support pull. So what the server does is you write down a URL saying, hey, my firm, your firmware image is here. And as soon as you write that URL to object five, the device will then start downloading that. And there are resources in object five that will tell you the status of, okay, it's downloading, it's been downloaded, so now, now you can execute and install it. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is uh, making comment about how uh, we disconnect from the end devices if there's uh, no activity. Um, yes, we could stay connected, but there are a few reasons why. In the end, uh, for device management, really, when you think about it, you're not going to be talking that much, right? So, okay, I want a firmware update. I want to read a serial number, well now I have that up in the cloud so I don't need to read it again, right? So you're doing stuff very infrequently, so actually disconnecting saves, saves more power. And another reason for that is if we stay connected to one device, we can't service any other devices. So um, we made the gateway, um, we, well we could support simultaneous connections, that's, that's more taxing, so we chose to support one connection and do the disconnect and then service who needs servicing. Yes, so when you open up that uh, connection to the end device, everything works exactly the same. That was, that was the benefit to tunneling lightweight MDEM and co-op over that connection. So uh, how firmware pull works is it actually, um, we're using an HTTP to co-op proxy in, this, in the cloud. So we actually are pulling uh, the image with co-op. Uh, for, 
for those of you not familiar with COAP, COAP is very similar to HTTP protocol. It's done over UDP, obviously, but it's got the same functions like get, post, and all that. So you basically you do a COAP get, and it has uh, blockwise transfers. So because we're just tunneling COAP and lightweight M to M, the end device then is asking for that. So it's doing all that. The gateway's just passing it through with, with, with no smarts at all. But we did add in firmware caching. So that way, if you have 10 end devices that need to update the same firmware image, uh, and they, they're all asking for the same thing. The gateway has, we added some smarts in, so that way we cache the firmware image, we look, and then we can just send that down and we don't have to download it 10 times. Thanks, Ryan. We're, uh, we're at the end of time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.